on behalf of QCOS, uh, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to everybody joining us on the line today. My name is Monica and I'll be your facilitator for this afternoon's special webinar event, COVID-19 Lessons and Learnings from our Victorian Friends. From Brisbane, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which QCOS is facilitating this webinar, the Turrbal and Yagara peoples, to elders past and present and to emerging leaders. I pay my deep respect to all First Nations people joining us for today's discussion. Across the country, we're joined by speakers on Wurundjeri land, Boonwurrung and the Boonwurrung lands situated within the great Kulin Nation. We have listeners zooming in from many different and diverse lands across this state and a very warm welcome to everybody. Just a few housekeeping tips to help today's session run smoothly. We've designed the first half hour as a listening session uh, and the second half hour roughly for a Q&A session and hopefully what will be a lively discussion. We're broadcasting in webinar mode. So if you hover over the bottom of your screen, you'll see the chat function where you can ask questions to our panelists. There's also a feature that allows you as the audience to upvote questions. Uh, and also this session is being recorded. So if that's not for you, then you can hop out of the session now if you've registered, then we'll send you a copy of the recording afterwards and we'll also be sharing it on our website at a later date. This event is part of a QCOS capacity building series that asks the question in the context of COVID-19, what will it take to create a strong and sustainable service sector to respond to the needs of our community? There can be no better way, I think, to contemplate this question than to listen to the reflections of our Victorian sector friends about that vicious second wave. Uh, I say friends intentionally, as we here at QCOS really wanted to convey a, a feeling of informality, connection and solidarity for what our Victorian counterparts achieved. So by way of intro, I'm really delighted now to introduce our, our three speakers. Chris Christofferou is the Executive Officer of the Ethnic Communities Council of Victoria. ECCV is a member-based peak body for ethnic and multicultural organisations in Victoria and is part of a national federation of ethnic councils across Australia. So ECCQ is obviously our Queensland version and a really warm shout out to all of the ECCQ uh, staff and member orgs that are also joining. On the so it's, it's from this perspective that Chris is, um, is going to share his reflections. It's my pleasure to also welcome Mel Thompson, Executive Manager of Clinical Services at Task Force. Uh, Mel's role uh, involves management and oversight of alcohol and other drug teams across Bayside and southeast of Melbourne. She also holds responsibility for origination wide clinical governance to support task force staff and clients across all programs. Mel has worked in AOD for over 12 years and a decade of that has involved management of clinical teams in both adult and youth treatment. And Mel is really the service delivery flag bearer for our panel discussion today. Our third speaker is Brooke McHale, Manager of Policy and Research at VCOS. Brooke has experience across a range of social policy areas, including health and mental health, uh, family violence and justice. In addition to her work at VCOS, Brooke has held senior roles at the National Aboriginal Family Violence Legal Services Secretariat and the peak body for community mental health services in the ACT. During the lockdown, I understand Brooke and her team played a vital coordination role between government and services on the ground. Uh, because uh, ECCV and Task Force are but three voices from Victoria for this inaugural event series, there are many, many voices that QCOS hopes to hear from throughout this capacity building series. So before I hand over to our speakers, uh, I, we thought it would be a useful exercise just to uh, convey through some of the statistics from Victoria, the scale of, of what was recently achieved. 
So Victoria to date has recorded 20,345 COVID cases since the start of the pandemic and 820 deaths, including Australia's youngest COVID victim, who was a man in his 30s. Victoria went from 7,869 cases on the 10th of August to none. Uh, and as, at, as of today, uh, Victoria has gone 33 days virus free. So, you know, they've reached the holy grail of elimination. At its peak on the 5th of August, Victoria hit a grim uh, single day record of 725 new cases. About half the total cases in Victoria were people born overseas. Nearly 2,000 cases were residents of aged care facilities. Uh, the figure in disability accommodation services isn't known, but we do know that they were spread across 60 sites uh, and services. One really outstanding achievement is the performance of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities to keep their mobs safe. So only, only 75 cases in Victoria were among Aboriginal people and no deaths were recorded. So it's a simple fact that Indigenous communities in Victoria and throughout Australia, I have to say, um, have outperformed mainstream Australia uh, in their response to COVID. So that, you know, is a really kind of uh, terrific fairy tale, but it's not. And we all know that uh, there was a huge collective sacrifice and predictably some of the most vulnerable people in the community were the hardest hit. So stage four lockdowns included an 8 p.m. curfew, uh, a maximum of one hour exercise outside, full school closure, all workplaces except essential services closed um, and restrictions uh, on, on, on being able to move more than three kilometres from your home. If any of that's not right, I'm very, very happy to be corrected by, by the participants. Um, and of course, what we heard a lot about was the controversial SNAP decision on the 4th of July to uh, lock 3,000 residents in nine public housing towers uh, into an immediate lockdown with very little advance notice, a high police presence, and with little, if, if any, access to uh, uh, the outside world. My understanding is that unlike the general community, the people in the lockdown towers weren't afforded the ability to have um, wellness breaks or, or outdoor uh, access to fresh air and exercise. So that's really the scene setting part of, um, uh, part of this discussion. And now, Chris, I'm really keen to invite you to, to tell us your perspective on this and any reflections that you wish to share. Thank you, Monica, and uh, thank you, QCOS and, and member organisations for having me here today. Um, yeah, I was absolutely um, thrilled to be invited to, to um, speak with you and, uh, and to, to share uh, uh, my experience and that of our organisation, the Ethnic Communities Council of Victoria. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on the lands of First Nations people and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and, uh, and acknowledge that uh, sovereignty was never ceded. Um, I'm the executive officer of the peak body for ethnic and multicultural organisations in Victoria. Um, we have approximately 220 odd member organisations, which are a, a mix of service providers, uh, ethno specific service providers, um, uh, mainstream, uh, larger, larger multicultural service providers and, and also affiliated um, um, mainstream service providers as well. Um, I guess when COVID-19 hit, it's strange because we were sort of, um, it was just before Harmony Week, which is um, um, the latter part of March. And uh, so that's obviously a busy time for, for our sector in terms of celebrating diversity. Um, I guess in Victoria, we're, we're really proud of our diversity. Um, you know, it's often, there's definitely a bipartisan view that uh, multiculturalism is a good thing. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and all sides of politics embrace it. Um, so we were gearing up for a, a, a launch event of an anti-racism campaign that we'd been funded to deliver here in Victoria. 
And uh, like everyone else, it's, uh, you know, that, that word about having to pivot um, really, really rang true. Uh, I was thinking about, it, I sort of didn't really want to use it, but um, you know, just that sort of the urgency of, of really just shifting gear and sort of reprioritizing and, and, and sort of thinking about our communities who would, were, were maybe not receiving the information and not aware of what was going on and, and the quick change that was required. So I think that um, we collectively, um, our member organisations, our own organisations, the broader social service sector really just kind of responded. And I'm sure across, it would have been the same thing across Queensland as well. So um, one, of the, one of the positive thing, things that's come out of this experience is uh, that, uh, you know, just that level of collaboration, I think, between, between sector peaks, service providers, um, communities directly. I think that that's been a, a really, a really amazing thing to see. Uh, people have, all, despite I guess some of the the failures, and I think Monica, you referred to re, referred to the second wave of infections. Um, despite that, I think you know what 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 really sort of has shone through for me during this time is is just how strong our civil our, our civil society is. Um, you know. <laughs> It was funny, uh, one of my colleagues today was joking about someone's parents coming to visit from Sydney, which is obviously a, a beautiful thing for, for, for the holiday season and uh, sort of saying that make sure that, uh, you know, that they dress in Melbourne style, which is now a, a black skivvy and a, and a face mask. So, you know, I think we've sort of done a really good job of, um, of, of sort of taking it seriously, working together and, and, and despite, I guess, um, some obvious failures, and and yes, you know, you, you made the very good point there, Monica, that um, First Nations communities have done very well uh, during a crisis, and and we've heard it uh, said by um, elders within those communities that it, you know they, they're so pleased that it's not their communities that that have been the the problem or the or, or the issue. Um, uh, unfortunately, that hasn't been the same for migrant and refugee communities. Um, as you pointed out, we've been over. Uh, our communities have been overrepresented in the statistics, in the mortality rates, um, and I think there are a range of reasons for that. You know, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of migrants and refugees are in insecure employment. Um, that's that's a fact. A lot of them work in jobs that other Australians may not work want to want to do want to work like uh, like um, social care or um, or or food production. Um, so again, those sorts of roles made people more susceptible, and the fact that we obviously have a very casualised labour force, or that, and, and that a lot of those roles are are casual positions. I think that that, that certainly exacerbated that second spread, uh, as you know, as as sort of came out of that quarantine, the quarantine issue. Um, I think the you know what really. What really concerned me, though, and I've and I've been quite open about this. I've been quite open about it with with VCOS colleagues and and with government as well. I think you know we've had to be as a sector peak really sort of speak up about some of the failures. I think, despite us being really proud of our diversity and the way that we do work together, I th one of the one of the one of the key reasons one of the key reasons why migrant and refugee communities actually suffered suffered worse than others was that. These communities don't have a seat at the table uh, when it comes to making policy decisions. These communities aren't properly counted in social service data. Um, you know, I, I, it was interesting. I was reading a FECA paper the other day, which is our national peak, and you know, the the standards for statistics uh, for capturing the diversity have not been reviewed since 1999. I mean. I find that completely astonishing, and obviously the fundamental reason why people were scrambling like headless chooks to, you know, identify identify the issues and find communities and and try to troubleshoot on the run. So, if anything, I think what what what's come out of this is that, you know, we need to centre diversity as part of our service design, as part of our thinking. Otherwise, you know, the, the next crisis around the corner, whether it's uh, you know, a, a bushfire or a, or climate change. I mean, if we don't get this right now, 
you know, those communities that I've said, yeah, you know, our communities that that have 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 had a propensity to be more vulnerable and to uh, negative health outcomes will suffer again. So, um, I guess, sort of in closing, what I'd say is that um, I I think our one of the one of the good things is is that I think our governments have our government has listened, uh, and um, and I think they are listening, and I think they are wanting to rethink things. And I would say this, and, and that's obviously true of the public service as well. Um, so I think there's a really uh, strong, strong appetite and, and, and a realization that I guess we need to rethink things now in terms of when we move forward, when we think about the way that services are designed, budgets are allocated, that that diversity, uh, you know, that, that diversity is 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 front and center of a lot of thinking, particularly in areas where there is. Uh, very high levels of cultural diversity, um, and that um, and that those communities uh, have have a, have a genuine seat at the table, so that they're informing. There's this uh, closed loop that's uh, informing the effectiveness of the interventions that are that are provided and the services that are provided. So, um, I guess sort of you know I'm looking as I was saying to Mel a bit earlier, really looking forward. We're really looking forward to the end of this year, um, and I guess sort of looking forward to um, you know, just resetting for 2021 and, yeah, just, you know, um, I guess celebrating the successes, as you rightly pointed out, um, you know, just a, just a massive effort by the whole of the whole of our, our, our broader community. But, um, you know, from a from a from a multicultural perspective, really just wanting to, to emphasize the importance of ensuring that, um, you know, that that solutions are no longer top down that that we we, we record and uh, count diversity properly and appropriately and then consider solutions in line with that. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. I was just unmuting myself. Um, Chris, thank you. That's uh, such a great opening reflection and gee you know the end of top-down solutions surely surely if there's one thing that we can take away from um, a pandemic it's um, uh, the need to kind of embed those approaches right across so thank you very much uh, so Mel over to you and you know as a service provider um, we're really really keen to hear what it, what it was like for your organization Thanks, Monica, and thanks for the invitation to speak today. Um, firstly, I'd like to also acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the first peoples and traditional owners and custodians of the land um, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, look, a lot of what Chris said, you know, certainly rings true for us, um, but particularly as I guess, you know, there's some unique learnings, I think there's some some really big wins, I think, that have come out of what has been, you know, pretty horrendous for a lot of people, I think. You know, it's a really long time to spend at home. I, I haven't been to the office since March. I think it was the 20, I want to say the 20th, somewhere around there of March, and it's, it's December. So it's been a really odd experience um, for our staff and I think for the clients. And I think the experience is really twofold, is to really have a look at the impact that this had on our staffing profile, which is um, which is really significant. Our staff deliver in the alcohol and other drug space face-to-face -face services only. That's the only way that alcohol and other drug services have ever, ever operated. There, there was no access to telehealth. Um, you know, the department um, and AXO as, as far as, um, you know, the providers of forensic services have always been. It's face-to-face -face clinical intervention um, whether it's outreach or in the office, and that's the only way that drug and alcohol services operate. So to all of a sudden be told to go home and ring the clients was this, what do you mean? How are we, how are we going to do this? This is, this is not the training that the clinicians have done. They're not telephone counsellors or online counsellors. You know, they've learnt their craft face-to-face -face, um, and delivered a lot of our services in a group format. As well, so whether that be to medium or high risk offenders, um, whether that be things like smart recovery um, and peer groups to support people in recovery, 
and all of a sudden it was how how are we going to do any of this we're not we're not set up to do it we don't have a telehealth platform and most community services don't have a telehealth platform and it was great that the department um, stepped in pretty quickly and offered um, you know the development of and payment of um, a telehealth platform whereby we could service our clients in a in a I guess safe and discreet way as well too you know there's for a lot of our clients um, it's very private so to be working out how you're going to have an appointment in your house or you're going to have to hide from your children or your partner or someone else that may not have otherwise known you were you were having treatment um, and the same with the family violence space is how do you talk about that in a safe way if the perpetrator of violence is sitting out in the room next door so really like some incredibly um some inc the huge challenges and i think that people have talked about a lot and and the media has um you know we talked about family violence a lot and mental health and self-harm and and all of those things um have definitely been issues but they've always been issues they may have been magnified or seen differently or presented differently but they're not new in the alcohol and other drug space um, they may have presented differently given that people were locked in their house and having um, I guess different issues with access whether that be around an ability to be able to leave the house and find some safety elsewhere um, and the same with access to particular types of substances. So, you know, for a lot of our client group, the ability to, to obtain a particular drug may not have been available. Therefore, they may have, um, you know, changed to using more alcohol, given that that was more readily available and one of the only shops that was still open <laughs> during lockdown. So alcohol was readily available, um, causing a new set of issues. So um, I think for, you know, a lot of our really marginalised clients, it was a really tough time but conversely there has been um there's a i think there's a bigger list of the wins for our client group coming out of this um than we could have anticipated and i know any time will tell what it looks like um going forward but we've managed to see more clients in this period of time than we have ever before um our rate of you know, forensic and mandated clients um, showing up for appointments has increased by about 35%. It's, we never have we been able to have that forensic group turn up any more than 50% of the time um, because some of the challenges are gone. So the not having to travel or get on public transport or um, have the money to get on public transport or attend or have credit on your phone or, um, the ability for there to be some flexibility with choice and control for our client group who are often, um, you know, again, not dissimilar to, to, Chris's, to Chris's group is they're a marginalised group and not too many people have a lot of time for a lot of our alcohol and other drug clients. So to give them for the first time ever, I think, a bit of choice and control in how they want to receive treatment um, and that's moving forward. So what I guess... You know, and I've said this, I think I said it to Chris before and to Brooke, was what does this look like for our staff and what does it look like for our clients now that we've got, I guess we've got a fair bit of freedom now. I feel like, um, you know, I can go to the shops now or I can go out for dinner, but I'm still not back in the office. You know, we're still only at 25% of staff can, you know, can attend a workplace. So we've got a few staff who are back now. Um, and able to deliver some of our face-to-face -face groups, which is great, particularly in the men's behaviour change space, um, drink and drug drive treatment, so people can get their licences back and get back to work. So, and some of our more vulnerable clients who really need to be seen face-to-face, -face, who need us to meet them in their own space in an outreach capacity, particularly our youth clients who have really missed being able to drop into our youth hub and meet our staff in their own space, whether that be at the skate park or a cafe or which they weren't able to do before so that's great that that's back on track but I think what we need to learn from this is um is the wins and about choice and control like this should be about responding to the needs of the community I mean that's sort of the title of this you know part of this seminar is what does that look like so if someone wants to have treatment from home and particularly for a lot of women who are carers of young children um, who may not otherwise be able to get to an appointment to be able to have a 
45 minute conversation at home um, and to be able to cater to their needs moving forward. That's what I hope. That's what I hope we don't say when we all get back to work. Because a lot of people are saying when we're all back to work, we've all been working really hard over the last eight months, all stuck at home um, with its own set of challenges of kids knocking on doors and being interrupted by something. Um, I think we need to find the balance is to work out what does it what does it mean going forward for our clients and what does it mean going forward for our staff um, when it comes to a work life balance? You know, once upon a time we would have said, no, nah, no, nah, you can't work from home. It's not, you can't do a, a clinical job and work from home. You can. So we've very clearly been able to establish that we can do that. So I think, you know, the learnings from me going forward is how do we get the balance right? How do we not insist that staff must be at work at 8.30 and they must leave at quarter to five or whatever it works out to be? Um, how can we sort of instill some more flexibility for our clients and for our staff moving forward um, and not lose um, not lose the good stuff because a lot of this, I think there's a lot of positives that have come from it as well. So I think we just need to look moving forward of how we balance that and to be looking at, you know, policy and um, funding, et cetera, and to have a look where it needs to be directed and what we can do, what we can continue to do well, um, and then how we undo some of the other stuff that has been quite negative. Thanks, Mel. So, I mean, I, I, I heard from that, we're not going back to business as usual and we're going to take those, uh, the, the kind of the positive aspects of what we've learned in terms of flexibility into how we reshape the work we do from here on in. Yeah, I hope so. I hope that's what happens for the staff and for our clients. Uh, thank you. And so, Brooke, um, we'd love to hear from, from you uh, as the as sort of the apex peak down in Victoria. Um, what were your sort of takeaways and reflections um, on what the recent experience has taught you? Sure. Thanks, Monica, and thanks, QCOS, for inviting us. Um, really happy to share whatever we can um, from what we've learned during this period. Um, oh, and I, I also would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm meeting on and the First Nations people all across Australia. Um, when Monica first talked to me about, or a week or two ago about, um, I was thinking about what to talk to you about and I sort of jumped to what have we learned? What does it mean for the next emergency for, um, you know, for how do we embed some of these lessons in the future? And that conversation is really important, um, hugely important. But the other thing that happened in the meantime was that uh, sort of out of nowhere, South Australia had an outbreak. Um, they went into kind of immediate lockdown. And I think it reminded me, even though it's still so recent in Victoria, it reminded me that it can still happen again. It can happen again in Victoria. It can happen again anywhere around the country. Um, so not only do we need to be thinking kind of about the, the medium and long-term future, but um, I guess the, the pandemic is not over either. You know, we have gone 33 days without a case. It doesn't mean um, we will necessarily go another 33 days without a case or, or longer than that. I think South Australia had seven months of no community transmission. Um, so that was important for me in terms of thinking about, we, we still need to have these processes in place. We need to be continuing the conversations. Um, I thought I would share with you today a little bit about kind of what we saw in and heard from our members um, in terms of demand for community services and, and what it sort of meant, um, how people's needs in the community changed, and also a little bit about what it meant for services during the outbreak and what kind of the, the challenges and demands on services were. Um, I think it won't surprise any of you to hear that absolutely demand for community services went up during the, the second wave. Um, we had more people seeking out food relief, emergency relief, crisis payments, mental health support. I think Mel, you mentioned that, um, alcohol and drug treatment. Um, and one of the things that, that struck me was that several of our kind of larger members reported that you know, around about a quarter of, of around about 25% of people who are coming for their crisis support services, emergency relief, were people who'd never accessed that kind of help before. So um, a new cohort um, of people who needed support during um, the second wave. And I guess what's um, worrying to a lot of our members about that is that those people, uh, some of them still need support now. 
Um, we know that the job seeker rate gets cut again um, at the end of December. Uh, we know that there's a lot of people who kind of either held it together during the, the second wave or for whatever reason, be that because they were, you know, they were locked at home with a, a violent partner or um, weren't, didn't reach out for the support that they needed then. So there's a kind of latent demand there um, that we expect is kind of coming down the pipeline. There are a lot of people um, whose issues and need for support might emerge over the next little while. Um, who might reach out for support, who because of, of um, the job seeker payment cuts will be sort of thrust back into poverty when they might have been able to make ends meet when the rate was higher. So that's something that the sector is really aware of, as I'm sure they are in Queensland, um, but there certainly has been that, that kind of um, growing mental health impact and, and financial stress that's been building during the second wave. Um, uh, we have, there's been kind of interesting findings from the, um, the closures of schools. So we know now that, that kids are returning to school that um, we certainly have reports of, of children disengaging. Some children actually did really well while they were at home over that extended period of time, including some children, um, you know, who, who might be considered vulnerable um, to bullying or, or who appreciated the flexibility of remote and flexible learning, who kind of thrived in that environment. But there are a significant number who haven't re-engaged now that schools have reopened. Um, and some of them um, are children that are developmentally vulnerable. So there will be potential long-term kind of impacts from that. Um, one of the things that sort of six weeks into the second lockdown, uh, one of the things that became really sort of critical was the, the high rates of loneliness in the community, particularly for people who were living on their own. Um, we, there were people who hadn't seen another person um, for months um, and who were really struggling with the loneliness that comes from that and the isolation that comes from that. As a result, we possibly too late um, or, or, you know, we, we could have done it earlier. The government introduced a single person bubble, which meant that, that people who did live on their own had the ability to, um, to have social interaction with one other person from another household. Um, but, but that was six weeks into that very harsh second lockdown, which meant that people had been really isolated for a long time. Um, the other kind of, I guess, demand um, that or, or issue that we're starting to see emerge is the um, kind of physical health impacts on people of the lockdown when they didn't go to their physical health appointments that they might have sort of preventive health appointments they might have otherwise gone to. Uh, we did interviews with, um, with a number of people across the community during and before the second lockdown and a lot of them talked about, you know, not wanting to go outside and exercise. They didn't know what the rules were. They didn't want to break the rules. They were worried about wearing a mask. They were worried about getting COVID. So there was a really kind of substantial impact on people's ability to kind of do their normal routines, do their normal activities and even just kind of get outside and exercise. So there was a, a sort of physical and the mental health impacts that came from that. Um, and the other thing that our members have told us is that sort of the nature of demand for services changed. So more people were seeking help, um, but also the ways or the, the sort of quantity of help, I guess, changed. And Mel, you might be able to talk about this later, but um, one of the things, and it could even have been you that told us, Mel, I'm not sure, um, but that some of our members reported was that, for example, young people um, were seeking contact with their youth workers, you know, maybe every day when previously they might have talked to them once or twice, you know, once a week or once a fortnight, but because they didn't have that other kind of interaction, they were looking for really enhanced support from their youth workers, which changed the, um, the kind of um, the way that community services delivered their services and, and how they kind of um, planned their work. Um, and similarly, services um, really proactively reached out to vulnerable families in particular. Um, more regularly, we know that we lost those kind of eyes of playgroups and kinders and schools and maternal child health services that, that are able to see when things might be, um, when, when vulnerable families and, and children might be struggling and things might not be great at home. We, we lost a lot of that during the, the quite extended, you know, 100 plus day lockdown. So services were really proactively reaching out more regularly, but that that was um, that had a significant kind of significant kind of impact on their capacity, I guess. Um, in terms of the other things that services told us about, kind of the new challenges that they experienced, um, uh, some of the really practical things that that um, might be of interest to you were just 
additional cleaning costs were huge. Um, some services did have positive cases in residential services and um, it tens of thousands of dollars potentially to, um, to meet the cleaning costs when you've had a positive case um, and, and, you know, the other kind of costs that come with that. And that meant organisations having to eat into their reserves in some cases. Um, PPE, so a whole bunch of organisations who'd never had to wear PPE before um, had to learn how to operate with PPE. Family violence workers had never had to, you know, wear gowns and masks and goggles um, before. Um, it was sort of an interesting, I guess, informal thing that happened is um, our community health services um, have got some experience with, with PPE and they have dentists, public dentists, who have significant experience with PPE and they didn't have a lot of work to do for a while because they could only provide emergency services. So I actually went out and trained some of the other community services workers who'd never had to wear PPE before, um, which, you know, it's just kind of an informal, one of those things that you were talking about, Chris, the kind of alliance and, and partnerships that we saw emerge um, just sort of informally. Um, and I'm aware of the time, so maybe just um, one or two other things and, and perhaps just touching on the, the point that you made, um, Monica, earlier about the, the public housing lockdowns. And I guess just a couple of my reflections on that. Um, one is that what really, you know, it, it, I think it, it's fair to say that in the early days that was a failure, that we had enormous numbers of police turn up, that the planning wasn't there in place. What did work was when... Um, the government eventually, after a few days, um, started working with the community organisations, the, the ethnic communities, the, the organisations that had relationships with the people that lived in those buildings, that knew their communities, that knew um, how to, um, what, what people needed, how to communicate with them, um, that sort of gave them that seat at the table and that involvement in the rollout. Um, I think my other reflection on, on the public housing lockdown is that, um, it, it wasn't unforeseeable, you know, that, that a dense living environment, um, shared facilities, um, that there could have been a case in there and that that had the potential for quite potentially catastrophic sort of consequences of a lot of vulnerable people being exposed to the virus. And, and we probably didn't do the planning the way that we should have. Um, we didn't have this kind of scenario in place so that, you know, government and the community knew what to do when that happened. So I guess one of my messages um, to, to Queensland as, as well as to others in Victoria is to start thinking about those kind of vulnerable settings now and, and what kind of planning can we put in place, whether it's for a pandemic or like Chris said, a bushfire or an evacuation. Um, how do we put those things in place to make sure that um, you don't have those, those first few days where it really was chaotic and, and people did fall through the cracks and not get what they needed in that, um, in that environment. So that's probably enough from me, Monica. That's so terrific, Brooke. What a really good overview and so many issues there. Um, <clears throat> a, a call out to anybody who's listening, if you have questions for any of our panellists, please use the chat function so we can get a discussion going. Um, Mel and Chris, is there anything that Brooke raised that you'd like to... Uh, respond to or, or take further? Um, and if not, I've got a question. <laughs> I, I don't mind sort of, um, you know, saying something about the public housing tower lockdown. I mean, that was, yeah. I mean, I think the, the stress levels were just, you know, um, beyond comprehension to, you know, uh, and, and particularly those people that were um, in those environments that, um, you know, just the chaos and and despite the best intentions, I think, you know, really there was more harm done than good at all. Like I said, the intention was good, but the harms, the harms were quite significant. Uh, you know, one of our current staff members was a resident of the is, is a resident of the Alfred Street Tower. And uh, you know, the 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 impact on him uh, is is ongoing. And and I think that, you know, it, it, it's it's um, yeah, but, but credit again to to the to the uh, to, to the Department of Health and Human Services. For once, communities actually were in control, and that's it, it was almost like this handover of power. And you know, having having the De deputy secretary co-chairing meetings with community um, and senior public servants doing whatever they could to try to respond to every single spot fire that was emerging, whether it was you know 
access to medication, formula, culturally appropriate food, you know, breakdown. Um, it, it was it was really it, it, it's kind of yeah. I think there'll be uh, be really good to see sort of some, some case studies that come out of this and some research because, um, and I know there's work going on at the moment by a number of universities, but um, yeah, it's um, it was uh, something we never want to see again. And 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 as Brooke was saying, you know, plan early, make sure you've got your structures in place. And I know that over the course of the second wave, that was something that what that has that has been achieved. Um, there's a lot of structures that have been set up as a result of that. So yeah, fingers crossed that they can kick in and, and play play an appropriate role. And maybe just to to add to that, um, I know Queensland doesn't have the same sort of I guess high density public housing towers. Is my understanding that that um, was this particular situation? But and I don't know, but I imagine you have rooming houses and potentially high density student accommodation, residential disability services. So some. Um, settings with similar characteristics um, where, you know, I guess there are some of the same risks. So, you know, even though the same situation probably wouldn't be rec replicated in Queensland, um, there are other scenarios where I think it would be good to start doing some of that planning and thinking, if it's not already happening already, of course. Uh, absolutely. I mean, those sorts of um, co-located living arrangements uh, are, are scattered right throughout, right throughout, you know, the state, um, and not just here in the southeast corner. Uh, there's a question from the Department of Communities, uh, and uh, it goes to the issue of um, whether whether we think better and stronger public education. And I think this goes to public health education would have made a measurable difference in in terms of numbers. Uh, I guess, in terms of COVID cases, um, because there was such misunderstanding of the symptoms of COVID. And I mean, we, we saw that too, um, people turning up to work, I mean, acknowledging, of course, the precarious nature of casual work, but also with a headache or, or a symptom that is really, really light. I think it did take quite some time before the message of getting tested um, and that you can be positive without having the full gamut of symptoms really sunk in uh, for people. So do you think that, yeah, the public health education, had it been more robust earlier on, would have made uh, much difference? Uh, um, I'm happy to comment briefly, and then, Chris, you might have comments for the, um, uh, the communities that you work with. I guess I was just reflecting on that question of the, the point that you made earlier, um, Monica, about the success in the Aboriginal community in Victoria. And I think one of the, the drivers of that, of that was the amazing work that the, um, the ACOs, the Aboriginal Community Controlled Organisations in Victoria did sort of translating um, the, the broad public health information into community specific, culturally specific, um, Sort of formats, but also, you know, I and I, um, I, I'm not, I don't work for an Aboriginal organisation. I can't speak for the ACOs, but um, but I did chat to a couple of them before this session, as we've been chatting to them throughout the pandemic. And you know, I know that they were their workers were out knocking on doors of elders um, that they knew probably wouldn't be getting the information in the same way. They they wouldn't be sort of accessing those mainstream um, information sources. Um, so I guess using that that community knowledge and tapping into that um, to make sure that that information does get to people in a way that um, that they will access, they will hear, um, and that kind of resonates with them. I don't know if you've got anything to add to that, Chris. Yeah, look, I think that that's just a great example. But um, you know, one one of the things that uh, some people have said to me is is that. You know, because that that obviously didn't happen in the multicultural sector. It was kind of, you know, as I said earlier, this top-down approach. You know, let's let's translate um, government government information sheets and hope that it somehow reaches people. Um, and you know, we all did our best to get the information out. But you know, Aboriginal communities have worked for two hundred years in terms of controlling their own affairs, getting reclaiming control of their own affairs. Um, and have worked hard certainly over the last 50 plus years to set up uh, you know their community health structures and I think that they've kicked in and been really successful so credit to them and um, um, you know and, and going back to that question I mean 
I, I think there's a bit of a risk of sort of putting the onus on onus of responsibility on communities in terms of believing information, you know. But overall, um, what what I think is Australian, just whatever whatever um, persuasion of politics, I think our governments overall have been quite consistent in their messaging in terms of the seriousness of the pandemic, and that's helped. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so a question um, for for any of you, but I think Mel and Chris, it probably uh, relates most to the communities that you serve and work with, and that's the possible role of social media uh, and 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 how sort of technology, I guess, facilitate facilitated uh, business continuation for for you, Mel, but also I guess as a way to attenuate some of the loneliness that Brooke was talking about. Um, are you guys able to give us an indication of, I guess, the relative importance of um, social media when face-to-face socialising just wasn't, wasn't possible? I know it's sort of incredibly important in some communities and, and less used in others, and there's different, different platforms for different communities. Mel? Yeah, I think, look, particularly in the youth space, so, you know, I've got adult drug and alcohol services and our youth services, um, and young people rely on, we know traditionally and statistically, rely on social media more than people who are my age. Um, so communicating with them that way. I think young people particularly, it was really interesting that if I look at um, our cohorts of clients, the ones who struggled the most were our young people. So the ones who are used to socialising um, in big groups ones who with drug and alcohol problems would be having significant issues with their parents and all the people they live with. So to suddenly be locked in the house with the people they don't get along with, you know, <laughs> so many issues, um, not only for the young person, but for their families. So the disengagement of schools, the inability of them to be able to physically see their friends. So um, social media played an even bigger part I guess what I was a little bit surprised at is given the propensity for young people to use social media, I thought they would struggle less in the inability to be able to see people because they're so busy with their phone up against their face that I thought, you know, and I say this from the fact that I have four, you know, teenagers in the house, is they really, they really missed the social connection more than I expected they would. So that seems that that adult sort of group adapted a little bit better not that there wasn't you know the loneliness and people who lived on their own that's a completely separate issue um, no matter what your age but from young people I was really surprised that the social interaction was so significant given the use of the social media platforms so it's really interesting yeah it is you know I guess the young people never cease to surprise us do they uh, and um, maybe as adults we have you know, the ability to kind of see that this too will pass eventually, but um, the world has seen that way um, from, a, from a young person's perspective. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and I mean, I guess as well, the, the digital divide that Brooke spoke of uh, in, in the context of education for young people, there's research coming out of the States that's really showing that the gap in the disadvantage gap and the education gap is going to sort of set, take a lifetime, uh, the research is showing to, to overcome the kind of, all the, all, the, all the advancements that were made have kind of been widened again. And there's, um, I guess that, that long tail of, of COVID recovery is going to be with us for a very long time. Uh, just an, another question has come through. Um, from Hannah, I'd love to hear about the visibility of children under child protection orders during the peak of the pandemic. How did organisations approach this by way of citing children and ensuring the safety of children in at-risk situations? Do any of the panellists have any knowledge? That's a fantastic question. Given that you're not necessarily in the space of um, child protection per se, but perhaps Brooke, you've got some observations from your members. Yeah, I can can share a little bit, but but um, I'm not a um, an expert in that space. But if if anybody is interested, we can certainly connect you with um, Child and Family Services in Victoria to kind of continue the discussion. I guess a couple of 
just sort of early reflection of um, brief reflections. Um, we know that child protection, that the government child protection workforce basically went back to kind of the, not the bare minimum, but the most essential critical cases. So there was absolutely a kind of middle cohort that didn't, um, that, um, that there uh, weren't being, I guess, followed up in the same way. Um, so there, there really has been risks for that group. And it's something that the, um, the Children's Commissioner in Victoria has been um, extremely concerned about and, and reporting on. Um, the other thing that happened or that, you know, and that you would all know is that, um, you know, Child and Family Services did do their best to reach out more regularly, those that were um, attending, um, working in person to going out to those families. Because one of the things that we know is that um, it's very hard to kind of engage with children, particularly young children over Zoom, we, you know, or, or, or remotely. Um, that while we'd been able to transition adult services um, reasonably well to remote service delivery, it was much, much more challenging for um, young children's services. Um, so our ability to kind of see and connect with those at-risk children was, was much reduced. There were also issues in Victoria um, around um, reunification of families um, where children were or are under um, protection orders. There's, a, um, there's some legislation um, that says that once children have been in the system for two years, um, it basically becomes permanent. Um, and because um, you know, families weren't able to have the same connection during the lockdown period, in effect, it meant that families lost about six months in that kind of potential um, to reunify and, and to rebuild their connection and, and do what they needed to do to be in a position to reunify. So there were some real challenges around that. The government did eventually make some allowances um, so that that two-year period could be extended, um, but that came quite late in the pandemic. So there were some families that were uh, impacted by having that, that kind of two, losing a significant portion of that two-year period. Um, so there have been absolute real challenges. We are now, I've seen some recent data that shows um, that both reports um, to child protection and notifications were well down, um, as were obviously substantiations because they weren't getting as many notifications um, and didn't have the capacity to follow up on them while they're working remotely. Um, right now we're starting to see a very significant kind of increase going back up, but, but we don't really know yet what that means in term, um, for the children in the meantime. So I'm not sure if that's helpful, but, um, but yeah, there's certainly a lot of research going on and there'll be more coming out about what it has meant for those children. Yeah, as the analysis continues. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, we're sort of coming close to time. Uh, there's a thank you for, for that answer. Um, so I guess one, one kind of closing observation to each of you is if you had, you know, one, and, and maybe, maybe this has already been answered, um, uh, but one key piece of advice uh, for government, you know, who is the main funder of all of our organisations, let's be frank, uh, uh, about, you know, things that could have been done differently and without wanting to kind of criticise because I think overall, you know, government has done uh, a really solid job in very, very trying circumstances. But if there could be one takeaway, um, what would that be, uh, Chris? Look, I think it's kind of, yeah, like uh, looking looking for a silver bullet to, uh, you know, a, a, a complex issue. Um, you know, I think um, it, it's got to be, there's got to be, there's got to be dialogue, there's got to be listening, there's got to be, there's got to be engagement. We've got to build on the good work that's happened in terms of that collaboration, that connection, that willingness to, uh, for, for government to listen. And I believe that, you uh, you know they are they are they'll, they'll obviously definitely be re reviewing what's happened over the last six months and and fingers crossed um you know there are some really sort of positive sort of new ways of working that come out of this so um i think we just need to sort of be prepared to to listen uh and, and accept responsibility and and agree as you said monica that i think people have done their best under trying very trying circumstances that's fantastic yes let's champion the constructive dialogue Mel. Oh, look, I totally agree with Chris. I think there's not much point in looking backwards at what we could have done differently. Um, and, you know, no matter which side of the political fence you sit on, um, 
no one knew how to deal with this. No one knew what to do. We all just went home and hoped for the best. Um, but I think if we can have a look at, you know, what can we do from here? How do we build on our collaboration? How do we, um, I guess, invest in some, whether it's research or, you know, bigger conversations about, you know, what worked well, what didn't, and have genuine conversations about how we support people moving forward. It just, I don't know, it doesn't feel um, like rocket science. It feels like this is a really, you know, unique opportunity to have a look at a different way of doing things and see what we can, you know, what we can achieve, I guess, for our staff, but also more importantly for our clients. Thank you, Mel. And over to you, Brooke. Thank you. Um, and I guess just echoing what both Chris and Monica said um, of the actually really quite incredible work that government has done, that it has been very hard and that actually they have, um, they have been, um, you know, we've been able to have conversations, they've been responsive to issues. I know that the public service have worked day and night for the last however many months and it's been, um, you know, the pressure on them has been immense. So, you know, absolutely there are things that we can learn and things we could have done better, um, but it was absolutely an unprecedented situation. So I think, you know, credit and we really appreciate the sort of seat that we've had in the conversations that the government um, has been willing to have with us. Um, in terms of the one thing that um, that would make a difference, I guess um, this is not a new this is not a new plug, and it, it is one that we will make forever. Um, but fund community organisations adequately to do the work that needs to be done. They will step up. Community organisations did step up. They were there for communities. You know, we had community health services that were on site at those public housing towers within minutes um, and they knew who lived there and they knew what, what those communities needed that, you know, the ACOs um, that, that reached out to get the information out there. So many community services across Victoria just stepped up without question, but a lot of them did it with no extra funding. Um, they had to cover all those additional costs around PPE and cleaning themselves. They ate into their reserves and they, they haven't been funded adequately. The, the indexation rates have been too, too low for too long. It slipped below the real cost of service delivery. Um, so value what community organisations do and how they step up in emergencies to be there for communities and value it by funding it um, to meet the real costs of what organisations do. So yeah, not new, but I guess it exposed the cracks. Um, no, no, rousing applause from Chris there. <laughs> and all of our panellists, there is no better investment than an investment in community. Uh, and the return on investment is, um, uh, yeah, absolutely more than, more than you put in for sure. Um, I'm afraid that is all we have time for today. Uh, a huge thank you to our panellists, Mel, Chris and Brooke for taking the time to join us and reflect on their experiences. A special thank you to everybody in the audience uh, for your interest, your active participation and for your great questions. Uh, a final plug for um, uh, the next QCOS event, next Thursday, the 10th of December, uh, we have a special live in conversation event with our new Minister for Communities and Housing um, as we discuss and dissect the Queensland State Budget and its impact on the community service sector. That's the 10th of December, which everybody will also know as International Human Rights Day, uh, from 8am to 9.30am. So that event is free for our members. And the, the cost for non-members is the, the price of membership. So uh, it's a great deal if you sign up. Um, the details for that are on our website. Um, so in the meantime, everybody, please stay safe. And if you are about to take a holiday break, you've deserved it. Enjoy, tap out, uh, have a great uh, end of year reset and get ready for 2021. Thanks, everybody.